Hello, and welcome to my talk on time prophecies from the Bible and the Quran that foretell the coming of the Baha'i faith, predictions of the great messengers of God, that would be the Bab, the herald of the Baha'i faith, and Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith. My name is George Vaya. I'm very pleased to be here with you today. And if you like, I shall get started. This slide here is what I call a time prophecy timeline. And what it is, is uh, basically what I'll be talking about. There are time prophecies, which are prophecies that give a period of time to occur. And I'll go into more detail about that in, in a minute. Uh, this is just a chart that we will be referring to at some point during the talk. This is a chart, I call it the promised one chart, from the messengers of God, the prophets from the progeny of Abraham, the four religions that uh, came from Abraham, and their expected promised ones. The path of Abrahamic religions and their expected promised ones is what I call it. And uh, we'll spend some time talking about this one too. Now before we get started, it's important that we understand what Bible prophecies are. And basically, Bible prophecies are as I say here, for the most part, simply beyond the ordinary comprehension of, of mortal man. Uh, the book of Daniel, the vision that he has of the promised one tells him to seal up the book even to the time of the end. And in the book of Revelation, there's a passage that says there was a, the book with the seven seals that no man was found worthy to open the book. And again in Revelation, the lion of the tribe of Judah a lamb took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne and was able to open the book. So here, what we see in the Bible is a lot of you know, nice tries, uh, but we'll never figure it out because the book of God is from God and only God can explain it to us. And the way he explains it to us is through his messengers. And if we try to figure it out, you know, we, we can try, but we likely won't and we will get something wrong because we're not divinely inspired. Now, the Lion of the tribe of Judah is an interesting descriptor. Uh, it's also referred to as a lamb. The lamb is a symbol of sacrifice. Uh, and in the book of Revelation, Jesus is telling St. John about his return. Uh, and he refers to himself as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Judah being the Jews. Uh, and the lamb being a sacrifice like he was. So the Christ, when he returns, will again be a sacrifice. Now, this symbol is the lion, as you can see. It's also the symbol of Iran. How do you like that? What a coincidence. Uh, now, to understand or discern the hidden or secret meaning of these prophecies uh, simply requires a divine intermediary. In the book of Peter, to Peter, uh, he says... Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, and then this is clearly telling us that even the prophets don't try to figure out what they're saying. They're being told uh, by the Holy Spirit what to say. And they're revealing the Word of God and not saying, you know what I think this means? So consider this again. You must understand this. Uh, and, and I'm not saying this. That's what the Bible says. We must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. De Baola says it a little more clearly. He says, none knoweth the meaning thereof except God and them that are well grounded in knowledge. Now, if you try to think of yourself as one of those who is well-grounded in knowledge, or that the priests are the ones who are well-grounded in knowledge, or the religious scholars, this sort of thing, uh, remember that the messengers of God are the ones who are well-grounded in knowledge, and not any mortal attempt. Now, before we get into these time prophecies, I just want to convey that, uh, you know, fortunately, God has made a covenant with mankind, with all of mankind, not just some of mankind, like the rich, or the mighty, or the powerful but to all of us, including the downtrodden and the poor, uh, that he will never abandon man to himself. And this is really part of the problem, because 
a lot of people would prefer that God abandoned us to ourselves. Uh, they have a pretty good racket going on, uh, rigging the economy to make themselves incredibly wealthy, uh, impoverishing others, ruling over others with an iron fist, um, this sort of thing. Anytime God appears, these people don't want God to upset their apple cart, even though they're pushing a bunch of rotten apples. And God's promise is that he will always send us a divine messenger, a specially appointed soul. And our reception, whenever we, you know, whenever God fulfills his promise and sends us a messenger, has pretty much always been the same. Now, you would think that when God sent a messenger, people would rejoice and be happy that, uh, you know, the day of God had come. Uh, but always it's been the same, that uh, the vast majority of people deny this messenger of God uh, and turn away from him and do everything they can to oppose him and to prevent his message from getting out to the people. Each messenger has a mission, which is to guide humanity to the path of righteousness. So, if we take this logically, if the messenger's purpose is to guide us to the path of righteousness, then we are not on the path of righteousness. Now, you've never seen a messenger come and say, what a great job you're doing. You don't need my help. He always says, you've strayed far from the path of righteousness, and only by abandoning your own interpretation of things and by following the messenger of God, who in the past has always been someone of low standing, poor, uh, sometimes illiterate, and someone that would be very difficult for a rich person to follow or for a powerful person to follow. Each messenger acknowledges the former messengers and foretells his return. And everybody likes to try to figure out when he's going to return. Although it seems that it's when they do try to figure it out, it's never in their lifetime uh, and never anytime soon. And what a coincidence that so long as the messenger has not returned, they get to stay in their seats of authority and learning and continue to do things the way they've always been doing them and not change. Now let's get into what is a time prophecy. A time prophecy foretells the appearance of a messenger of God, or it foretells a significant event. Uh, Jesus is foretold in the Old Testament. Uh, he's referred to as Messiah the Prince. Muhammad is referred to as uh, the Comforter and my two witnesses, which refers to his, uh, according to Abdu'l-Bahá, my two witnesses refers to Muhammad and his son-in-law Ali, who was the successor to Muhammad. The Bab is referred to as the Qa'am in the uh, Quranic writings and traditions uh, in the Christian Bible. And the Old Testament is referred to as the promised Christ, the Messiah. Christ, of course, is a, a Greek word, Christos, uh, that is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word for Messiah. Messiah is an interesting word, uh, title, as it were. It means roughly uh, someone covered in oil. That's why we refer to Christ as the anointed one. But in this day and age, we don't do much with oils. So the significance of the title is lost on us. And we simply rely on the name Christ to refer to the promised one. Baha'u'llah is mentioned repeatedly over and over throughout the Bible and in the Quran. In the Bible, is referred to as Michael the Great Prince, the Lord of Hosts, the Ancient of Days the everlasting Father, the Spirit of Truth, the Lord God, the glory of the Lord, the mighty God, the glory of the God of Israel, the Father. And there are still many more. I, I, if I were to refer to all of them, it would uh, lengthen and interrupt the course of the discussion. A significant event that is foretold in the Bible is the restoration of Israel. Now, generally, you would think that such an obvious fulfillment of a biblical prophecy as the return of Israel would be a source of joy and comfort to many people in the world, to most of the world. In fact, in the Quran, there's a whole chapter, a whole surah on the coming of Israel. It's called Al-Isra. It's directed to the children of Israel. And one of the prophecies is that soon, as the Lord destined for thee a glorious station, glorious station, and you shall serve the Lord with all thy might. So the mighty, powerful Israel is not only a fulfillment of biblical prophecies, but of the Quran, and you would think people who would read the Quran would be happy and would not be uh, trying to destroy Israel completely, which is another prophecy that God promises will not happen. So who could thwart the will of God? Certainly not mortal man. 
Now, a time prophecy is a prophecy that specifies a length of time for it to occur and the originating event. So that these time prophecies are actually mathematical formulas that can be laid out and determined. Uh, they're finite. They're not someday in the near future that'll never occur. They're not, oh, um, even far distanter than that. They are specific lengths of time. And they all, many of them, they resolve, which means they occur, and they resolve at the same time, many of the same ones. And that's what that time prophecy chart timeline points out. So the question is, as I've been hinting at, will everyone recognize the Lord? In the book of Luke, he says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? The question seems to answer itself in the negative, that no, he shall not find faith on the earth. He's never found faith on the earth before. Why should he find it now? Uh, but everyone likes to think, well, we're going to accept him. And they pray oh, repeatedly, Lord, Lord, reveal yourself, unveil yourself from behind the the veils of glory, so that we might see you and offer our lives for yourself. And they keep saying that, and they keep saying that. And they'll never, well, they might. But it'll take a long time before people recognize uh, that the messenger has come. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. There's another prophecy. So my question is, do ye think not? So if ye think not, it very may well be that he has come. And again, isn't that a wonderful thing? Wouldn't you want to know that your Lord has come, that God has kept his promises? Now, there is some concern. This is where people try to figure out what a prophecy means. This prophecy, like a thief in the night, says as follows. Well, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, there is a prophecy that says this, the Son of Man cometh like a thief in the night. Now, many Christian scholars say that uh, they have interpreted this to mean the following, and that what they say is true, that one, a thief does not announce his coming. Okay, let's look at that, because first of all, the day of the Lord is not a thief. The messenger of God is not a thief, but the day is like a thief in the night. So it's a, it's a comparison. Um, now, a thief doesn't announce his coming, and yet repeatedly Jesus said, I'm going to come. And the Bible repeatedly says this is a time that it'll happen and the amount of length of time that needs to pass before it happens. So in this interpretation that a thief does not announce his coming is a way of saying we don't know when and we can't figure it out. And it's definitely not today. So it seems kind of self-centered that this interpretation uh, doesn't really produce anything. It just gives everyone a reason to keep looking and to never find. And number two. Therefore, we can never know the hour of Christ's return. Okay, now that's interesting. You could know the day, the week, the month, and the year, but not the hour. So in, in that sense, I do agree that you're not going to know the hour. But what the Bible says is that, but of that day and hour, no man knoweth, only God. But again, the week, the month, the year can all be figured out. Okay, let's go back to the thief in the night. The Bible actually says just the opposite. In Revelation 3.3, 3, it says, If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. So any failure to not recognize the messenger of God will be our fault if we're not watching. We have to watch. Now, watch also means to investigate, because when the messenger of God comes, the way we know it's not that there's a great big fanfare, that the skies open up and he descends from heaven, and it's clear and obvious to everyone. He always walks among us, and then one day makes an announcement that he is the promised one of God. So, there's, like I say, there's no big fanfare. And if you're not watching, and then it, you're not going to see it. And if you are watching, and you hear it, you must investigate. So, watching has a component part of not just waiting and watching and idly waiting for someone to tell you, by the way, he's come, or some Christian or some religious leader to tell you, oh, yes, he's come. Now you can believe in him, and they, but they still want to keep their position and their authority. There is a component part of having to investigate for yourself the claims of the messenger of God. And again, it says, thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. They'll miss the hour. Now, this 
like a thief in the night, when looked at objectively, is actually a warning to Christians and to anyone else who reads the Bible. Like Muslims, they read the Bible too. This is a warning, especially when you read it with, in conjunction with this verse from the Bible that says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whoso openeth the door, whoso heareth my voice, and letteth me in, I will sup with him and he with me. So again, there's nothing hidden about standing at the door and knocking. And he says, Behold, open your eyes, look. I stand at the door and knock. This is a warning about something else. This makes it clear why it's a thief in the night. Because when the messenger of God is knocking at the door of your heart and asking to be let in, now how polite is that? How completely polite it is of God to say, will you please let me in? You don't have to, you know, but you can. Uh, It is the epitome of grace and politeness and kindness. We're not forced to recognize God. We're asked to recognize God. So when he's standing at the door of your heart and knocking, a thief is not welcome in your home. And as the home of God is the heart of humans, this is a warning that says that Christ will knock on the door of your heart and people will say, don't let him in, it's the thief. And they will reject his messenger. They will reject Christ when he returns. And surprisingly enough, or shall I say not surprisingly enough, when people began to follow Baha'u'llah, when he made his claim, and the Bab, when he claimed to be the Messiah and the Qa'im, and the return of Christ, um, the Iranian government illegally seized all the possessions of the followers of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. So they were stolen from them like a thief. So they very much were treated like a thief. A thief also goes to prison. And Baha'u'llah spent 40 years in banishment, exile, and imprisonment. Abdul Baha spent another 40 years, but when you add the time that he was with his father, Uh, Before they were banished to Akka, he spent uh, 54 years, along with his father, in banishment, exile, and imprisonment. Abdu'l-Baha is the son of Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah, as I said, is the founder of the Baha'i faith. It's a title that means the glory of God, Baha'u'llah. And Abdu'l-Baha is the glorious servant. Now these are some prophecies from the Bible that point out what will go wrong. Uh, In Matthew... In the gospel, he says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant? So you might want to listen up to this one. Uh, He's asking a question. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. So the faithful and wise servant gives them meat in their due season, is a ruler over his household. This is referring to a religious leader and a scholar. And to give them meat, of course, it's not enough just to feed you food. The meat is the, like the bread from heaven, manna, uh, in due season. is the time of the coming of the Lord. And Matthew offers blessings for that servant who recognizes himself as a servant and not a leader, who, when his Lord comes, shall continue to guide the faithful to the Lord. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. There are a lot of exalted people walking around, saying that they are the ones who know everything and have figured it all out, and somehow it manages just to keep them in power continually. But know this, the prophecy goes on, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Now let's look at this for a minute. The good man of the house is the leader of the flock, that if he had known in what watch, not what hour, but what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, meaning he didn't watch and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. There is no house more broken up than the Christian religion. There are, by many accounts, over 50,000 different denominations or sects of Christianity, all of which claim to be the true and rightful version of this religion and, uh, that the, and denies that the other you know, 49,999 have any validity. 
Now the prophecy goes on to say, But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. Okay, let's look at that for a minute. My Lord delayeth his coming. So when you ask religious leaders, uh, now this is, remember this is generic, so it can refer to Muslim leaders too, that evil servant shall say, My Lord delayeth his coming. These are people who say, well, It's not today, and it won't be in our lifetime, and it could be a long time coming, and keep following us. Matthew refers to that person as an evil servant who is obviously misleading uh, and leading his followers astray. Now it continues, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants. Again, how many Christian denominations fight among themselves and saying they're wrong and we're right, and to eat and drink with the drunken, drunken on the, their own power and their vision of themselves. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so uh, we have seen House Broken Up looks like. This is a compressed chart. It has a few of the main denominations that have arisen since, I guess, the 1500s when they call it the Reformation, uh, which is their attempt to justify splintering into thousands of different of contending sects of one religion. In fact, it was Jesus who said to Peter, On thee I shall build my church. He didn't say, Go forth and multiply, or my churches. So really, Christianity would be well advised to come back into the fold, uh, to reunite, uh, and to do God's will rather than their own will. But apparently at the time, uh, these changes were necessary, uh, and this is what Baha'u'llah tells us, is that as time goes by, God sends us a new messenger because times change, and the needs of the new times are different from the needs of the old times, and that it's impossible to continue to live under social laws that were valid 2,000 years ago, or 1,000, or 4,000 years ago, uh, when we have evolved into uh, different human beings. So that's why God sends us the messenger. Of course, we don't listen to the messenger. And that's why there's so many different Christian sects in the world. Now, this next slide is a, a more organized breakdown of, again, some of the many thousands of denominations in Christianity. Uh, many of whom contend with each other and uh, dispute with each other and say bad things about each other and how they're not, these other groups are not the true Christianity, but they are, even though they cite no religious authority uh, or no authority from the Bible that establishes their particular religion, of course. So anyway, let's not spend too much time on this. 